Hi everyone, I'm Professor Lusheen and this is Lecture 1 for Safety 380, Introduction to Occupational Safety and Health. In this first lecture, I just want to give you an overview, a background of the overall safety profession and just answer these really basic questions. What it's like and I'm going to share stories. Uh, why do people even choose to go into this and I'll share my uh, reasons. Uh, why does it require passion for people? And then I've also got some updated worker, uh, I'm sorry, compensation employment statistics to share with you. For this first lecture, I do have some additional videos posted. Caution, if you suffer from post-traumatic stress or um, have difficulty uh, vi seeing things that are that are difficult to watch because people are, get, get, are getting injured and they're sharing their story, if you have a problem with that, it's okay. You don't have to watch them. But I just would like you to get an idea of what it's like to be... Uh, working in the profession and what we have to deal with on a, not a daily basis, but frequent enough. And then also I have some new additional links. The reason I like it, and I fell into it, totally lucky. Um, I was interviewing for several different positions. I actually wanted to work for the Pollution Control Agency. I was really into environmental engineering. I'm going to do like sampling from stacks and other waste streams. I wanted to do that. And I had done... Uh, an internship working for a county sampling well water looking for lead um, this is back in you know 1991 uh, I also did two other internships doing uh, recycling or environmental and uh, controlling hazardous waste things like that so I really enjoyed that and that's what I was expecting to do after graduation lo and behold um, OSHA contacted me because they hire from the same list as I was on the state list went in with the interview you know, they're telling me, okay, you get to use all this equipment. We'll teach you how to test the air and noise, radiation, uh, thing. You know, it, it was, it just sounded so cool. And they're going to give me a badge, <laughs> which was pretty badass. Uh, pardon my language. Um, but yeah, you could flash it and make people cry. And I, I kind of enjoyed that, especially at the age of 22. I was really young when I started. Um, and I just, I absolutely loved it. I, I really got into it. And, and it was because of that first line. There's no two days alike. It was different every day. I got to go into so many different workplaces. Uh, if I had to estimate, I probably, I was doing anywhere from my earlier years, I was doing maybe 35, 40 inspections a year. By the end, I was up in like the 70s and 80s. And I worked for six and a half, seven years for them. So, you know, do the math. It, it, it was somewhere that'd be four, between four to 500 different workplaces. It was really cool. I liked learning about all that. Uh, I really like the uh, diversity of people you work with, especially if you are assigned to a particular company. You're talking to uh, the CEO you know, in the morning. In the afternoon, you're doing walkthroughs and training with custodial staff. I like that. I like you know, seeing how the, an organization or business works. And that's safety. We get to see all aspects of it. I think that's cool. The biggest reason for me is that um, I'm very much a an introvert and a technical person, and um, but I do like to socialize, which is weird. I'm like this, you know. It's a weird imbalance. Uh, I'll just say that I, I like speaking, I like teaching, I like instructing, and when I go to conferences, meetings, and things like that, if you see me, you'll be like, he's not an introvert. He's oh, he's talking to people and he's doing all these things, but it takes a lot of energy out of me. Uh, to do that. So if I'm at a conference, you'll see me in the morning talking to people and presenting, and then you won't see me for several hours because I have to remove myself and kind of recharge my batteries and breathe a little bit. Uh, but I really, I like being able to study people by talking to them and watching them, but then also um, knowing the the engineering of things. I That's just kind of who I am. I also like that um, we do make a difference, not only in the business, but in people's lives. And it, it, yeah, sure. Some people may work in this profession and just kind of sit back and go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm meeting uh, the regulations, OSHA standards, which we'll talk about later, uh, different uh, lecture. But um, I see it from a different perspective. I, I, I actively seek out to see how I've affected people's lives. So uh, there, is a, there is a considerable need for well-educated safety people. And it's not really the educated as far as knowing the standards or having something memorized, but being versed in complex problem solving. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. To withhold and to teach others to withhold our natural response to someone, you know, getting hurt or, or being part of an accident. Because we tend to blame. 
that's a very natural human response. We tend to blame, especially the person most proximal to the accident itself. And we need to fight that urge, that natural urge, in order to get to the root cause. And as as you're listening to me, you could probably think of instances in which you, you, you know, it wasn't your fault. You didn't intentionally mean to slip and fall, bang into something, injure yourself, but others who may be around me have blamed you for it. It was your fault. You did it intentionally. And that's not the deal. Um, and that's why the social psychology that goes along with this profession is fascinating to me. And that's what I went to graduate school for. Um, there's also, there's great placement. I'll get into the stats in a moment. Great pay and flexibility. I really like the flexibility. Um, and I noticed that, you know, I talked to my friends, you know, I was working for OSHA or, or anything. And, you know, they're at a place all day long. And we get together at the end of the week. And, you know, I was able to drive around during the day. You know, it's just, it's just, I like that. I like that freedom. Uh, you do need to be a lifetime learner or a lifelong learner. Maybe that's a better way to put it. I'm always on the look for understanding what's new, what's going on. And I, I follow people now too. And not only just, you know, read periodicals, I follow people because I like the work they do. <laughs> so um, another is that we're kind of a really close-knit community. Uh, if you, especially if you come meet me on, on LinkedIn, I'm tied into different groups on different continents. Uh, I can reach out and I do talk to people. They ask me questions. Uh, and so I like being part, it's almost like a family, like a second family. And I do really, and that's why going to conferences and meetings, you get to hang out with these people and they share their stories and their passion. And it's just, I, I just, I can't get enough of it. I love it. I'm like addicted to it. <laughs> So uh, this is one of the readings that I used to have students do. It's um, nine years old now. It was published in 2011, in which NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, we'll talk about them later in the course, did a study. And what they found, and you can see kind of the summary on the screen here, that um, their survey indicated within the next five years, there's going to be a, a certain level of new uh, safety professionals needed. And then they studied to find out what the academic programs were planning to produce. And there was a, a quite a quite a gap there. And so the question was, well, who's going to fill in all these safety positions? And to be honest, what I see is uh, people who are plucked out of a, you know, either for the production floor, maintenance, whatever, and say, okay, you're going to do safety now. And then sometimes those people, they can go get an education, which is good. But we still have people who get called upon to do safety and they really don't know what they're doing. If they're a people person and they're good at strategic thinking and problem solving, they'll be okay. They'll do all right. But we also have, uh, we have a few online degree programs that are non-university based. They're online university uh, that aren't very good. And there's a lot of people coming out of those programs and I'm seeing that their performance and what they know and what they do is not adequate. It's not professional, um, and it's it's very it's very narrow. Typically, just regulatory based, but they don't recognize that, and that's one of the problems. It's you know, the the best safety people are the ones that are most passionate about it. Early in my career, when I was working for OSHA, I just loved it because I was learning something new every day. And I was getting out into, into different work environments and I was talking to people and I loved it. But then I went on a, as a backup inspector, um, compliance officer, on a fatality inspection. And it was at a brewery. And so part of me is like, ah, I get to go see a brewery. Cool. Uh, but we sat down to interview the night foreman because the, the death occurred the night before. And we're asking him questions on what happened and what did he see. And... Um, this guy, I mean, this guy was like a monster. He could have been a linebacker for the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, but he's weeping uncontrollably. And I never, I, mean, my, I never saw my dad cry, so I didn't think that was something men could do. I, I, I apologize. I was just, I was stunted like that. But he's bawling and it really affected me. You know, th it wasn't just a worker. It was one of his good friends. He knew it. He had to, you know, call the, the, his wife and kids and let him know that he had passed. And I had to leave the room. And it was that visceral, powerful experience that even gave me a, a greater depth um, of appreciation for what safety professionals do. Because 
when you think about it, I mean, we, we do, we honor our, our armed service men and women and our police officers and our firefighters, first responders. But if people are just going to work, you know, doing what they can do to contribute to an organization and take home compensation to live and to provide for their family and they die in a, in, 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 you know, that commitment, that, that bothers me, I think you know, more than a lot of crimes that occur that you know, almost every day. That really bothers me. And so my commitment was, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent uh, people from experiencing that and their family members and their loved ones experience that loss. They were just trying to provide. And I, that, again, that does, uh, that really affects me. And I've had other experiences as well. And so there are some things in this field that I will not budge on because of that those experiences. That someone is going to die should this happen or this occur or whatever and I get them out of that situation. There are others where it's like it's a less likelihood. I may talk to them about it. It's up to them. Fine. But there are some things I, I, I will stop. I mean, as a, as just as a person in public, I will stop and talk to people. It's just what I do no matter where I am. So um, just like I had indicated, I'm going to be sharing um, stories like that, not so (laughs) uh, deep as that, but um, yeah, just to kind of share with you you how we practice. There are some videos posted that will be similarly uh, saddening or difficult to hear. That wasn't difficult to hear, I'm sure. Uh, But I want you, if you can, if you feel like you can stomach them, please watch them. It just, it helps. Uh, explain why we are who we are. This is from the the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, This is 2019 numbers as far as pay and they talk about the jobs and the growth and employment change and things like that. This is for occupational safety health specialists and technicians. It's close enough. Oh, this is within healthcare even. Oops. Or maybe they classify us under healthcare. So if you need to, I did provide a link. You can go to the Occupational Outlook Handbook through BLS and you can look up your own background. Uh, which is interesting, uh, just because we bring that up real quick. Uh, based on today's enrollment, and I know it's going to fluctuate a little bit, uh, 28.5% of the people in this class are enrolled in safety majors. Uh, 35% are enrolled in human resource management, either major or minor. And 25% are general business majors. So um, we have more human resource people than we have safety people, then a close third is general business. And that accommodates about 88% of the total students enrolled at this time. So we've got a very diverse group here. And I hope to serve all of you. I hope you all get something out of this class. So the uh, median pay in 2019, according to BLS, was a uh, little over 70,000, and that's all experience levels. Every year, uh, Safety and Health Magazine, which is a National Safety Council publication, they do something called the Safety Survey. Uh, EHS Today does it, ASSP does it, a lot of different groups do it. For 2020, they oh, they have a breakdown based on, um, they didn't really give us, oh, they gave us the media, it was 98. So this is higher than what the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported. Um, it just depend, depends on who replies to it. And I think this is the same data or I think what they're doing is sharing the data from the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. So here is a link, and I think I provided it, a link to the industry salary calculator. This is the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. See their average at, at the 50th percentile is 98. Um, so, And I, I don't know if this is actually meant to be a normal curve or not. Um, something that maybe I'll have to look into. Forget, this, they've got over 8,000 respondents to their survey. But we know there are a lot more safety professionals out working. This is from their 2019 numbers. They actually broke it down by region. I just think that's interesting simply because when you, you know, if you're working in Whitewater versus a job in Chicago, you know, you better be making a lot more money in Chicago because it costs more to live there. If you go to the West Coast, it costs a lot more. Things like that. You guys know that stuff. So this is getting even closer to home. So these, this is my um, internship data that I've been collecting since 2015. And you can see these are the wages that our interns get when they do their capstone, their final internship before they graduate. The average and the median back in uh, spring of 2015 was uh, you know, $15, 60 to $15. 
fast forward up until like last summer, the average was over 19, the median was 18. And this last fall, we only had two people, so that it's difficult to trend that. Last spring, and this was pandemic spring, really high numbers. The average was 22, the median was 22. So we had some really high pay. I think we also though had like three or four students who were actually hired on full time prior to starting their internship. So they're making salaries. So that should probably be an asterisk. In the, uh, in the graph in your upper right, I, I kind of trended it. You can see how the trend has been going up. So this is six years. So over six years, it's gone up about you know four to five dollars per hour. That's impressive. That's you know that's that's awesome. That's really great for our students. Uh, I've got the overall six-year average. As you can see, we get we have about forty students graduate per year. Uh, the overall average is seventeen eighty. The median is seventeen fifty. The high is thirty four dollars per hour. The low is under nine dollars an hour. And I actually know which place did that. I've also just recently in the last two years started tracking non-capstone summer internships. So we have students who, we have, we've always had an abundance of internship opportunities. Um, for a while we were turning away anywhere from 20 to 30 opportunities per summer. But now I've been really pushing non-seniors to do a non-credit internship over their summer. And the pay is very good. As you can see, just in two years, Murray had 78 students, 48 in 29, 2020 was pandemic, we still had a, you know, close to 30 students do it just for you know pay and experience themselves. And you can see that the average is somewhat comparable to what our capstone students are making too. So that, I think that's really cool. <sighs> Let's wrap things up here. Um, over my 25 year plus career, I've come up with this seven points um, of a philosophy I use for not only teaching but practicing safety because I do still practice from time to time. Number one, uh, and most important, is that safety is an attribute of work. So a lot of my graduate work was industrial engineering and understanding the design and flow of work. Safety competes with quality, with personal issues, with deadlines and things like that. Knowing that it is competing may, puts you in a better position to find acceptable, practical resolutions versus focusing just on it. Because if you run up to someone and ask them questions, safety, 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 they're going to answer responses as if safety is the focus. But you have to put it within the context of work. Things that you know distract or cause it to become second or third or fourth as a concern. Next is that workers do not want to get hurt. And this goes along with what I had mentioned earlier that we tend to blame people. People should not be blamed for getting hurt. They didn't intend to get hurt, but their intent was to get something done. They just didn't realize that there was a level of risk or a um, possibility that they could get hurt. Or maybe they underemphasized the possibility or the risk. So uh, we shouldn't blame people. We got to find out what led to it. Next is workers want to do a good job, at least initially when they're hired. And it's typically through their experiences at work that if they start, if their desire to do good starts waning, it's because of the social aspects of that, in, of that company. Poor communication, poor relationships. People tend to not put in uh, more, put in adequate effort when they feel they've been cheated or treated unfairly. And sometimes that's being blamed for getting hurt when they didn't intend to get hurt. Um, or seeing that they have a coworker who's getting the same compensation, the same recognition or more, um, and they're doing half the work. It's like, why should I work the way I am when I could do half as much and make exactly what they're making? I've experienced that before in my work career. Uh, workers want to be treated fairly. Everybody wants to be treated fairly. Um, you may you know, think of it within the last week that you got mad at somebody, a stranger. What did they do? Did they cut you off? Did they do something that upset you? And maybe, you know, maybe you're not as volatile as I am, but it's like, oh, you know, I want to swear at them or I want to confront them or something. The reason we have that response is because of equity theory. We, we want things to be fair. We want things to be equitable. And, you know, whether it's giving somebody the middle, middle digit or saying names or whatever, tailgating for driving somebody, yeah, um, we do that as a form of communication. We're trying to educate them that don't do that to me. And um, workers are the same way. You know, you treat them unfairly. They may not, you know, give you the the middle digit. They may not say bad things to your face. 
but their work and their commitment will wane or they'll leave. Another next one is that organizations would need to make a profit. And what I should say is management needs to be needs to realize the cost benefit or value of safety. That's what it really means. That you can't just have 100% safety. That would be insanely expensive and um, not realistic. You have to pick and choose. You have to um, compromise. You have to demonstrate. You got to do your homework. Next is that organizations are as unique as individuals, which means you cannot buy a safety program. There are companies out there, consultants, who sell safety programs. No, don't do it. Um, I once did an OSHA inspection in which you know, I, I was going through my list of things I was supposed to be asking for and reviewing, and I asked for a program. And the, the, the safety manager took this binder off the shelf, unwrapped the plastic wrap that he purchased it in, and handed it to me. I'm like, what is this? Oh, that's my respiratory protection program. I'm like, this is nothing. It's just been sitting on your shelf in plastic. And he paid thousands of dollars for it. A good safety program is built from within and made and actually made effective through iterative improvements. There, so there's an approach to it and not a, an answer to it. Next is that organizations are only as successful as the success of each individual. And that goes back to the number one. If we can design work so that people can be successful, that people can do it in a safe manner, and hopefully they can elicit some satisfaction or pride from what they do and get along with their coworkers, we're going to have very productive workers and we should have then a very efficient production system. Oh boy, closing comments. Um, please, you know, I'm sure you, in order to get to this video, you're already on Canvas. Take a look at the links I provided. If you have the stomach um, or fortitude to watch the videos, please do, or maybe try it. And if it's starting to get too much for you, stop. Uh, it's just one assignment this week, no quiz. And um, I just want you to, I want to speak to some of the things I've covered here. So there's really nothing to read this week. There's just view some videos, check out some links, and uh, you know, provide some responses. If you have any questions for me, please reach out to me. Um, I provided my contact information on the Canvas site in multiple places. But we're done with lecture one. I look forward to talking to you next week.